Well, the British uh, comedian and actor and writer Stephen Fry has been featured in a YouTube video which has gone viral. As I speak these words, I think it's got about six million views. Uh, he was interviewed on an Irish uh, program, and the uh, interviewer asked him, because Fry is a, is a notorious atheist. He's like Hitchens and Dawkins. He's a kind of ferocious atheist. The interviewer asked him, now suppose you're wrong about your atheism, and you die, and, and you get to the pearly gates, and you meet God. What would you say to him? And Fry's response, that's why the thing has gone viral, is, I would say, what about bone cancer in children? Explain that to me. What about all of the horrific and undeserved suffering in the world? The interviewer says to him, well, you probably wouldn't get in if you say that. And he said, I wouldn't want to get into heaven. I would never want to spend eternity with such a cruel, capricious, malicious, and stupid God. Now, the, the rant goes on for about five minutes. I'm giving you just a little hint, but you probably get the drift. Look at a lot of the um, reaction to it. A lot of people saying, this is great, and finally, you know, someone making this argument, and boy, is that a knock-down knock argument against religion. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, we have heard the argument before. Almost every major theologian in our tradition, from St. Paul and St. Augustine all the way to C.S. Lewis, has wrestled with this problem of suffering. How do you reconcile God's existence with undeserved suffering? So we didn't need Stephen Fry thank you very much, to remind us of this problem. Secondly, look at someone like Thomas Aquinas. Thomas uh, formulates the objection uh, very pithily. He says, if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be destroyed. If there was infinite heat, wouldn't it eliminate all cold? So we call God infinitely good. So wouldn't that eliminate any evil? But there is evil. Therefore, there's no God. That's a darn good argument, and Thomas formulates that as an objection to God's existence. You get all the, the power of Fry's argument without the histrionics. Again, my point is, we know about this objection. We've uh, wrestled with it. Here's the other thing. All of it, from Paul and Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, C.S. Lewis, all of it is rooted finally in the single greatest rant against God's injustice ever recorded. And it's not in an essay by an atheist, old or new, it's rather found in the pages of the Bible. I'm talking, of course, about the book of Job. So we know the, the uh, outline of the story. Well, Job, in one fell swoop, uh, has to endure every type of suffering. So in, in, in one moment, he's stripped of his, of his health, of his wealth, of his livelihood, of his family. It's all taken away. And we know, furthermore, that Job is an innocent man. And so there he sits in, in agony from the suffering, but also in a kind of theological agony. I mean, how could God have possibly allowed this to happen? And Job delivers himself in the course of that book of rants equal to those of Stephen Fry, calling out God. We know that friends of Job arrive and they uh, offer you know, explanations of his suffering, and they're pretty pathetic. They're, they're theologians at their worst, if you want. So Job eventually dismisses them, and then in one of the most dramatic scenes in the Bible, he calls God into the dock. You know I'm innocent. Why am I suffering this way? And what ensues is chapters 38 and following is the longest speech of God anywhere in the Bible and, and one of the most dramatic speeches of God. What does he say to Job out of the desert whirlwind? He says, Job, where were you when I made the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I told the sea where to stop? Where were you when I stored up the, the wind and the hail? He takes Job on a tour of the cosmos, revealing to him all of the mysteries and anomalies, including, by the way, a little introduction to two creatures, one called behemoth, one called leviathan, probably a crocodile and a whale, creatures that Job probably has never thought of. And God says, I made them, how beautiful, how strong, how impressive they are. I made them just as I made you. In other words, they're part of my creation too. Now, what's the point? The point is, God is not so much answering the problem. Is he situating the, the problem within ever wider frameworks of meaning? God is the Lord of all of space and all of time. God has providential care for all of space and all of time. 
whatever we're experiencing is in the context of this infinitely wider and more complex situation. Here's a, a comparison now with Job in mind. Take uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you know, how many pages, 2,000 pages, whatever it is. Imagine how one page of that book is ripped out and cast to the winds. Let's say it floats on the winds for months. It, it becomes further tattered, only bits of it remain here and there. Someone now who's never read Tolkien stumbles upon this fragment of one page and reads maybe one paragraph of this great sprawling novel. Now, maybe he picked up, you know, just a piece of bland narrative. Maybe it's a, a little happy incident. Or maybe he picks up Frodo and Sam in Mordor at the depth of, the, of their suffering. And he reads this one paragraph. And he goes, boy, that was a terrible story. Whoever wrote that must be some kind of monster. I mean, to have written that, that thing. That little fragment belongs in a page, which belongs in a chapter, which belongs in a sprawling 2,000-page novel. We who've read the story know that that terrible suffering of Frodo and Sam is ingredient in ultimately this comedy, ultimately in this great, joyful, and life-affirming story. Here's the point, and I'd say this as a first response to Stephen Fry. What do we see of God's providence? We see one tiny swath of space and time. One little fragment, one sliver of space and time. Do we see good things? Yeah. Do we see terrible suffering? Yeah, both of them. This makes no sense. There's no justification. There's no meaning in any of it. You see how arrogant that is? How absolutely unwarranted that is? How can we possibly say, based on this little tiny experience of God's providence, that God's overall providence has no purpose or meaning? It's a bit like someone who knows no mathematics stumbling upon this hyper-complex algebraic formula and looking and saying, it's just a bunch of gibberish. That doesn't mean anything. Look at these, these nonsensical symbols. How arrogant, <laughs> you who know nothing of mathematics, to be pronouncing on a complex algebraic formula. The awareness of the various contexts for our experience is needed before we pronounce on meaning or lack thereof. Here's a second observation. If you believe in God, and remember the premise for Fry's question was that God really does exist. And what would you say to God? If you accept that God exists, you accept that there's a life beyond this one. That this life is not the ultimate horizon of existence. There's a life beyond this one. Once you know that, can you say, yeah, the, the suffering of a child in this world is terrible. Of course it is. Of course it's terrible. Bone cancer in children. Of course, it's terrible. Of course. But, but, is it nothing but terrible? Is it irredeemably terrible? Is it terrible, period? Or is it perhaps ingredient in a much larger story? Is it perhaps even a route of access to a deeper and richer life? The day on which Jesus was uh, betrayed, denied, abandoned, scourged, unjustly condemned, led to his crucifixion, and left to die on a terrible instrument of torture, we Christians call Good Friday. How in the world would you call that day good? Because that day is not the final day. That's not the ultimate word. But beyond that, there lies resurrection. To believe in God is to believe in that possibility. And that provides another framework uh, for this question. You know, so I guess I would say, finally, to understand why Christians call that day Good Friday is the ultimate answer to Job and the ultimate answer to Stephen Fry. 